Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to AEI for today's conversation, The Role of Business in Overcoming Poverty, uh, Entrepreneurship for Human Flourishing. I'm Josh Good, and I manage our work with faculty partners at Christian colleges around the country uh, on behalf of AEI through the Values and Capitalism Project, which is uh, hosting today's event. And I want to give, before we get too far into things, a uh, special shout out to two different groups who are joining us today via live stream. One from uh, Dr. Gary Roberts' government class at, at Regent uh, University here in Virginia, and another group of 85 students who are joining us from the LCC International University in Lithuania. And that group has uh, a, 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 uh, it's 7.05 p.m. in Lithuania right now, so they've just had a little, little, uh, little pizza party. Uh, that group has uh, Christian college students from Ukraine, from Russia, from Latvia, from Lithuania, from Germany, from the Netherlands, Moldova, Belarus, and the United States. Uh, so welcome to all of you, no matter where you're joining us from. Uh, today, if you are in the Twitterverse, uh, or if you're following this uh, conversation online, you can also note the hashtag uh, pound role of business. Uh, in case you didn't pick up, for those of you who are here, a copy of this complimentary book on your way in, please know that we have uh, a copy for each of you uh, as you exit, Entrepreneurship for Human Flourishing. And you can learn all kinds of things in that book, including some things about today's speakers. Um, I want to make one or two brief introductory comments before uh, introducing to you uh, our conversation leaders. Um, so this short book is about a big foundational insight. And in rereading it, I was reminded that context really is key when you're applying any core insight, any big aha. What is that big aha in the book? Well, here it is. You ready? Work is a good gift. It's an inherent part of what it means to be human. In the Judeo-Christian tradition, we know this because God himself worked and because he invited us to reflect his image in stewarding the earth and in exercising dominion by tilling the earth and making it fruitful throughout the entire created order. We know this, too, because Christ our Lord, for those in the Christian tradition, shouldered the vocation of a small business, uh, to borrow Michael Novak's words, working as a carpenter or a builder for perhaps six times as long as he spent in public ministry. This basic insight, work is good, can be applied in all kinds of capacities, to student life, in terms of thinking ahead about your future vocation, to matters of political economy and thinking about the anti-poverty solutions that actually work in terms of honoring the path to self-sufficiency rather than ongoing dependency, and in massive global advances that have been achieved in the last 40 years, which are talked about at length in this book. How? Well, through primarily the rise of, of globalization, property rights, free trade, the rule of law, and entrepreneurship which also helped to provide a big picture vision for the path forward. That vision, to borrow from the book's title, shares a name with an exciting new AEI project, Human Flourishing, and it ought to be our end game. What's the world meant to look like? Well, it should be bustling with productivity and creativity, full of dynamic and meaningful work, and it should absorb our individual callings and advance the well-being of others throughout the world. So how do we get there? That's the topic of today's discussion. That's what we're here to talk about in all the gritty, down-to-earth um, realities of, of daily work. Uh, there are grassroots entrepreneurs, there are small businesses, and there are big businesses that each have roles to play. Uh, of course, as important as differently sized companies uh, is the caliber and the character of people who are leading or staffing those companies. And so you're, you're going to hear some of that uh, in today's speakers. Uh, each of, of those who are before you have applied uh, these basic insights in the book in their own unique contexts, uh, just as we're doing and partnering in wide-ranging and different ways with Christian colleges, uh, campuses throughout the country, and occasionally even with places like Lithuania. Uh, so today we have three speakers who reflect a genuine passion for professional excellence um, and a simultaneous concern for people who are at the margins of society. Their biographies uh, reflect both their professional success and also their strong regard for the well-being of fellow sojourners in at-risk places. And so I'm going to introduce uh, Peter, and then Elise, and then Jonathan, who will speak to us today in that order, and then we'll turn to you for a fuller conversation. 
So Peter Greer uh, serves as the president and CEO of Hope International, um, a faith-based microfinance, microfinance nonprofit organization that advances entrepreneurship and work throughout the developing world. They do amazing work, uh, rooted in the central conviction that people have the talents to pr pursue their own self-sufficiency and hope. And Peter is a graduate of Messiah College, one of our partner schools. Um, uh, he holds a master's in public policy from the Harvard Kennedy School. He's worked on the ground in Rwanda, in Zimbabwe, and in Cambodia. He's co-authored five books on faith and international development themes. Here are a couple of titles just to give you a flavor for uh, what he has been up to. The Poor Will Be Glad, The Spiritual Danger of Doing Good, Mission Drift, a book that he recently wrote with his son Keith, Watching Seeds Grow, and this mini book, uh, Entrepreneurship for Human Flourishing. Um, next, Elise Beeler is the Associate Director for Global Commercial Assessment at Merck, uh, where she has worked for the last eight years. Um, you have her bio, but you know you can learn an awful lot more about Elise Beeler on page 36 of your book and in the pages that follow, um, which describes her family, her journey, uh, her role as a member of the Cherokee Nation, her degree at Rice University, and her decision to, to work, work in big business at Merck. Um, she co-leads a job creation venture there called Project Sacred Dream, and she served on the board of Philadelphia's Healthcare Business Women's Association. She also chairs the Philadelphia chapter of Hope International, and she's a passionate uh, advocate for women in science, technology, engineering, and math. Uh, and finally, Jonathan O'Connor is a graduate of Southeastern, um, as well as the Darden Business School. Um, today he serves as a banking officer with the Commercial Banking Division of uh, M&T uh, Bank in Buffalo, New York. He co-founded a group called LifeNet International, um, a nonprofit that improves the performance of primary, cl primary care clinics and hospitals in Burundi, in East Africa. Uh, he has also held a variety of positions with private equity firms, was a beta member of the Acton Center for Entrepreneurial Excellence, which you can just learn, learn more about at myej.org. Um, and he's doing some very interesting work in Buffalo that I hope he'll share with us a little bit more about today. Uh, so uh, again, thank you for coming. Peter Greer, welcome to AEI. Um, the podium is yours, sir. Great. Well, I don't think we properly recognize all of our friends from Lithuania who are having a pizza party and listening to this right now. Can we clap for our friends in Lithuania? I think that is awesome. And all of you, thank you for being here. Uh, one of the incredible joys uh, has been getting to know Josh and the amazing work of uh, values and capitalism as well as the American Enterprise Institute. My first interaction was actually in this room when I got to have a debate, throw down debate with Shane Claiborne about some of these similar topics. And that started what I consider a very meaningful friendship with Josh and many of the other friends here at AEI. And it's great, great, great to be back. Now, if you heard my bio, you might uh, be asking a question. If today's talk is going to be about the role of business in alleviating poverty, then why is a nonprofit person up at the podium when there are so many other entrepreneurs creating value, doing amazing things? And it actually gets worse, because if you look at my background even further, I am the son and the grandson of pastors. So I am a preacher's kid. I'm a grand. Uh, grandchild of, of multiple pastors. My uh, one grandfather memorized the New Testament and would go around the country singing. My grandmother would play at the piano, and that's kind of how I grew up uh, in that environment, very much in the church environment. Every Sunday, every Wednesday, all sorts of occasions, I would be at church, and uh, oftentimes in the back row with my brothers making paper airplanes. But regardless, I grew up very much rooted in the church. And so what am I doing here? Well, one of the things that my father, one of the things that my mother, one of the things that my grandparents taught me is that if with my mouth I profess that I am a follower of Jesus, then I should actually follow in the footsteps of Jesus. And you cannot read the account of what Jesus was all about. Then this is someone who cared deeply for those who are marginalized, for the broken, for the poor. And as he would go around, he would be having this amazing message, but he also would be saying, how do I demonstrate this message? By caring for the least, by caring for the forgotten. 
And when asked what the greatest commandment is, what did Jesus say? He said to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. And so as I had the opportunity to go on mission trips, as I've had the opportunity to travel all around the world, I've been asking that question, what does it look like to love God and to love my neighbor? And, and growing up, I don't know about you, but my model of what that looked like would be to go and to look in my closet and to realize I've got a whole lot of excess simply because of where I was born. And so our model was to pack our suitcases full, to show up in a foreign land, to unzip our suitcases, to give stuff away, to give a word of hope, to give an encouragement, to get back on the plane and go home. And that's what I thought it looked like to love God and love my neighbor. But the more that you do that, and my guess is maybe some of you had have, have had similar situations, the more that you do that, the more that you start to have these questions that start to gnaw at you. These questions that you sometimes can marginalize, the questions that when you go back and you show a slideshow about the great things that you just did on your trip, sometimes you don't always talk about the challenges because the people that gave you support want to hear the good news. They want to hear the good story about tell us all the good that happened. And yet the reality is the more that we perpetuate that model of us just going, us just giving, there's something in the back of our minds that we know isn't right. And for me personally, there was this question. Initially, it was any time we would go and any time we would give stuff away, you would look around and you would see at how many people you're not helping. You would see that you just chose through the random lottery. There are a few people that you're going to be able to help, and the vast majority are going to be on the sidelines wishing that they would actually be better. Remember in Haiti, there was one woman who told us uh, this when we asked her why she didn't make some modest improvements to her home, and she said this. She said, the summer is coming, and if I improve my home, I won't be seen as the neediest person in my community, and I won't be picked as the one who gets the extreme home makeover. I won't be the one who gets a brand new home. And so the idea that she might be picked in a random lottery as someone who is really in need actually provided this disincentive for modest improvements that she could have made. So that's number one. There was always this problem that we never actually help enough. The second thing that always bothered us is what happens when we're gone? What happens? I, I don't, uh, I've never told this before, uh, but when I was living in Rwanda, uh, one of the early things that I was so excited about was a give a goat program. We found a group of widows that were truly in need and uh, friends from Massachusetts where I grew up ended up giving really generously and it was this beautiful program where I had grown up hearing about all these great programs that give away animals and I thought while I was there I want to do something similar. And so we got names of needy families and we ended up buying goats and we ended up giving them away to this community. And it was an awesome experience. Like we're giving away these goats and everyone, it wasn't just give a goat, everyone had to first catch their goat. So people are running around trying to grab a goat and the goat that you got was the one that you got to take home with your family. And it was just like a carnival, it was just wonderful. Went back to that same community not long after and every single one of those families had sold the goat and were in exactly the same spot they were before. I wonder sometimes, are we really making an impact? And that kind of nod at me, that sometimes we go and we have this moment where we see progress, and yet in the back of our minds, we know that as soon as we leave, the situation is unchanged. And there's something in me that knows that that's just doesn't make a difference. The third thing that I started to see is I was painting a, a wall in Haiti, and as I was painting this wall at an orphanage, and as I remember doing this incredible work of, of just bringing up gravel, we were putting a second wall and painting, and an incredible experience for me, an incredible experience, but I remember as I was doing this one thing of pulling up these gravel pieces, I ended up looking over the fence, and there was a line of able-bodied men that were there just waiting to have the opportunity to do something in work, how much more effective, how much more efficient would it have been if instead of me thinking I was doing all this good, I would have recognized that there already are people who want to work who simply haven't been given the opportunity. And, and the list goes on and on and on. So I kind of backed into the current line of work after recognizing the simple truth 
my good intentions don't always have good results. And if I'm serious about loving the Lord with all of my heart, mind, soul, and strength, then I want to use my heart, mind, soul, and strength to say what's the best that we can possibly do to make an impact in places of extreme poverty. What works? What works? Because that's what I want to be about. And I came to this startling realization, this startling realization that is so elementary that I actually am upset with myself for not realizing it until I was already well on the path of doing humanitarian work. The simple truth is this. If you want to care for those in financial poverty, you have to care about business. If you want to help those in need, the very best way to help them is to help them find a job so they don't need your charity anymore. That simple truth is a truth that today is unknown by many individuals on college campuses today. And I give you some examples that all of the individuals that really have hearts of gold, all of the individuals that really want to serve the world, and you ask them, what's the way that you're going to take your desire to help the world? You know what their response is? I'm going to work for or I'm going to serve with a nonprofit. And somehow we've elevated that calling that if you really care for the poor, you're going to work with a nonprofit. And we somehow have missed the very noble and the very high calling and the very real impact that if you want to care for the poor, a key part of that is helping them not be poor anymore. And the way that you help someone not be poor anymore is by helping them have a job where they can use their hands, they can use their creativity, they can use their giftedness in providing for themselves and transforming their communities. That is so simple, and that simply is the message of the book that we want to share, that if you care for those in poverty, it is a high calling. It is a noble calling to apply your gifts and abilities to the world of free enterprise, to the world of business, and provide many opportunities for individuals to work their way out of poverty. That's kind of all I want to say. But that's not enough time to take. So I'm going to give you five things that I also have learned beyond that. Here's what I've learned. Five uh, additional points. And then I can't wait to hear from my friends Jonathan and Elise. And more uh, than that, I'm really excited for us to have a conversation together with this amazing group of people here in the room. But here are five additional things that I've learned. First thing is I believe this inability to understand the simple truth that giving a job is better than giving a handout reflects something deeper. And the deeper thing is this. We have not listened to those who were in financial poverty. We have not listened well to those in financial poverty because if we were to listen well, we would realize that every single man and every single woman, if they're given a choice between having their children become someone else's charity case or having the dignity and joy that comes from providing for them, they're going to choose the dignity that comes from providing for their family. Their kids don't want to be someone else's charity case. The problem is we haven't listened because I believe if we ask the question, how can we help? We are going to hear a resounding and unified answer. I simply want a job. Jim Clifton writes about this in The Coming Jobs War. That entire book is really about listening to individuals and the massive amount of research that simply having a job is the primary preoccupation of individuals all around the world. When we listen, we understand that people want a job. Second thing that I have uh, realized in, in doing this work is that the, the gift of work restores dignity. Now, when, when, when I talk about some of the challenges of charity, I, I left out what I think is one of the biggest ones. The biggest challenge that I found is that a model of charity that says we have a lot of stuff, other people don't have a lot of stuff, that model, if repeated time and time again, actually reinforces uh, a, a greater power dynamic. And here's the way that it works, and we've all seen this. If I am going into a community and I am giving stuff away, how does that make me feel about myself? I feel pretty good about myself. Look at me. I'm the one who's going and helping around the world. And so I take a few selfies in the midst of giving stuff away. I post them on Facebook. I get all kinds of likes. And I feel really, really good about the impact that I'm having. But who's on the other side of that equation? If I'm feeling better about myself, what's happening to the person who is constantly in a position of being a passive recipient? The reality, and I've seen this, is over time, the head goes down 
and the hand goes up and it's not good for the giver in inflating their self of pride and it's not good for the recipient who slowly feels worse about themselves. There's a book uh, called Toxic Charity by Bob Lupton and in it he tells a story that resonated with my own experience. He said when individuals in his community in Atlanta would every year around Christmas time go into places of need and give stuff away, he said a couple things happened. He said the moms would put up with the indignity of having someone take care of their kids because they deeply wanted to provide for their kids. They said the dads, the dads would all leave out the back door because they couldn't be there to experience what he wrote about as the dehumanizing impact of having someone else take care of his kids that only reinforced their sense of shame, their sense of their inability to provide. And so he said the dads would rather leave than be there and put up with that, with that lack of, of, uh, of self-worth that they could not provide for their kids. I saw that uh, growing up as well. So that's number two. Number two is it sometimes if we're not careful creates the system of some people feeling better about themselves and some people feeling worse about themselves. One last uh, situation on that. I was just in Burundi a couple weeks ago. I uh, got to see some of the uh, work of LifeNet as well as the work of Hope International. And one of the people that was there, uh, he had forgotten his toothbrush and his uh, shampoo. And if you've been traveling uh, around Burundi, uh, you really want your toothpaste, toothbrush, and shampoo after traveling a significant amount of time. And so we did uh, what we uh, needed to do. We just simply went into the market and we ended up uh, having this conversation uh, with one of the entrepreneurs that were there. And I tell you, at that moment, there were no weird power dynamics. There was no sense that you know we're coming in and, and we're gonna help you. I tell you, the only power dynamic was one of equals having an exchange where both parties are better off. That's the kind of mystery of business, is it's this wonderful sense of equalizing where both are better off. We needed shampoo, we need toothpaste, we needed a toothbrush. That individual provided for us and we were able to pay that individual for the investment that she had made in getting those materials in there. The power dynamics were not one feeling superior and one feeling inferior. The reality is we were coming together in an exchange where both are better off. That is the beautiful piece of business where actually both believe that they are better off as a result. Number three, I believe the gift of dignity is that uh, the gift of work, the gift of entrepreneurship is that it actually creates value. When I spend time around the world, one of the greatest uh, obstacles to progress is this idea that if somehow I advance, it's at the expense of someone else. Hope International has this model, and part of the reason we use this model of community-based economic development is because we want to destroy that illusion that if some people advance, it's because other people are worse off. This fixed pie thinking totally needs to end, and we need to figure out a way to start helping people start their own pie-baking businesses, where literally there's more to go around. And when you group individuals together, and where it's not just one person flourishing, but you get to see the society coming together and everyone becoming better off, I believe that's where there's incredible hope and incredible progress. And again, Hope's model is just a powerful way that I get to see that in the work that I do. But I was in Rwanda and got to see a group of 23 Rwandan widows after the genocide come together, come together to support each other. Initially, they started saving 10 cents. They each put 10 cents on the table. Eventually, that 23 women had $2.30 that week number one was on the table. They invested in one of their friends who bought charcoal to start a charcoal business. Next week, they did the same thing. Another individual got it. Next week, another. Next week, next week, next week. Basic financial services. You don't get more rudimentary than that. Everyone contributes a little bit. You pool it together, and someone has enough to have some sort of a productive investment. When I was there, this group of 23 Rwandan widows had partnered together for multiple years. They literally had bought two grinding mills that were constantly working, adding value to the community. They also had bought a truck so that this truck was used in distributing what they had produced to local schools. They were involved in helping some local schools. Not only that, we literally got to meet in the church that they had been building with their profits. 
And again, that was an entire community seeing what was possible when it wasn't just one individual, but literally all of them joining together and every single one of them experiencing progress. So it creates value. It restores dignity. dignity. It's what those in poverty want. Two final ones. Uh, what I have seen is that a business has the opportunity to address root causes and not just the symptoms. And again, meeting with some fantastic social entrepreneurs, the vast majority are addressing not root causes but symptoms that if people were not in poverty, they would be solving these problems on their own. Uh, you've probably heard the story where there are some uh, individuals that are in a river and that need help. So there are three individuals, right? And the first one jumps in and ends up grabbing one and, and, and uh, going back to shore, an incredible rescue. Second individual ends up immediately looking for some things to create a raft and ends up very quickly trying to make a raft and push it out to actually get more people on. And then the third person, you see that person swimming upstream. And I say, what is that person doing? They said, they keep on being people that are coming in. I want to go upstream, and I want to figure out how we stop them from getting in in the first place. And that is what I have seen time and time again, that truly, if you help individuals, if you help them start a small business, they are so ready to take care of the needs in their community, and they humble me in their generosity uh, when you only empower them to do that. Last thing, I believe that business provides the opportunity to have conversations that are about more than money and we all lose when we truncate the discussion of poverty to an issue about money again coming back to loving God and loving people I believe that this is an incredible opportunity in the workplace not in some sort of other context but to simply in relationship with the people that you spend time every day with to simply ask the question what does it look like today for me to love those people that are all around me. And when we see that, when we see that the purpose is not just a financial transaction, I believe that is where we equip incredible flourishing to happen. Last thing that I want to say, I want to give one thought uh, to nonprofit leaders, one thought to uh, business entrepreneurs as a way of trying to change the conversation. Here's my simple uh, suggestion to nonprofits around the world. Stop thinking too highly of yourselves. Stop thinking that there is this idea of a noble nonprofit and we must put up or tolerate business as a way to just merely get the funding that we need to do the good work that we're doing. I believe nonprofits need to recognize that the simple work that's happening all around them needs to be celebrated, needs to be encouraged, needs to be spurred on. We need to find some way of stop telling stories that merely elevate nonprofits and somehow diminish everyone else who's doing other work. I love that Jonathan's here, and I hope that Jonathan's here, not just because he was involved in starting a great organization in Burundi, but I hope he's here because he's a commercial banking that is investing in the very lifeblood of this economy so that incredible change can happen, and I love that. Nonprofits, we need to stop thinking too highly of ourselves and recognize that there is an important role to play for everyone. Second thing, for those individuals that are in the commercial workplace uh, creating value, I would encourage you, don't separate your philanthropy from your business. Don't separate your philanthropy from your business. And for some individuals, it might just be possible that you could have a greater good instead of maximizing every penny so that you can give it away to a nonprofit, you might have a greater impact by figuring out how to make sure there is flourishing with every single employee that you are given the opportunity of stewarding. I wonder if we can somehow transition from this crazy idea that there's some transition that has to happen in life to transition from success to significance and recognize that there is success and significance that is available every single day in the work that you do. We need to tear down this secular divide. I love what A.W. Tozer says. He says this, it's not what a man does that determines whether his work is sacred or secular. It is why he does it. I would love to see more examples of business friends that recognize the high calling that it is to be in the workplace and that recognize that why they do that is so much deeper and so much more important than just making money. That's a part of it. 
but it is a part of a broader conversation about what it takes for human flourishing in every business, as well as every church, as well as every uh, nonprofit has an important role to play. And it's time to recognize that all are necessary and together there's a far greater impact. Last thing for those that are in the workplace. First Timothy 6 says this, he says, uh, those people that have been blessed, those people uh, financially, he says, don't put your hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but put your hope in God. And then it says this, command those to do good, to be rich in good deeds. And I love that. And to be generous and willing to share. So there is no nonprofit, there is no for-profit that has some special calling for all of us. The question that I have is this, what does it look like for us to truly live lives where we are rich in good deeds and that together we can contribute to the amazing gift of watching flourishy, flourishing societies and a flourishing world. Thank you so much. So hi everyone, my name is Elise Beeler and um, I just want to first of all just thank you all for being here today. I'm really honored just to have the opportunity to uh, share a little bit of my story with you. Um, so, so essentially my story is about how I am using the power of a Fortune 100 company and you know one of the largest pharmaceutical companies um, you know in the world to help alleviate poverty uh, here in the U.S. And um, I guess where my story begins is probably back in uh, 2006 when I was graduating from college and uh, I was faced exactly with the dilemma that, that Peter was describing, where I had an opportunity to go uh, work in the nonprofit route and, and I had an opportunity to go work in big business. and. Um, you know, when I was graduating from college, uh, I had a degree in chemical and biomolecular engineering. And ultimately what I wanted to do though, is I wanted to find a way to address healthcare disparities in Native American populations. Um, so my, my background is that I'm a member of the Oklahoma Cherokee tribe. I spent um, most of my childhood growing up in the heart of the Cherokee Nation in Oklahoma. And, um, you know, I, I guess what I, what I learned and saw firsthand through that experience uh, was my, my grandmother. She, was, um, she had a lot of health issues. I, was, I guess I was seven years old uh, when she had her first heart attack. And um, it was over the course of the next 15 years that I watched her go through um, strokes and diabetes and amputations and cancer and it was ultimately Alzheimer's that ended her life. And so I, I spent a lot of time in um, Indian hospitals and I saw really firsthand what healthcare delivery and healthcare systems look like in Indian country. And I felt very strongly that something needed to change. So that was what I wanted to do with my life in some way, shape or form. And the opportunities that I had before me were A, I could go work for uh, Teach for America and I could go to a reservation in the Dakotas and I could teach math and science to students on reservations that you know, desperately needed, um, you know, I guess, help in pursuing that kind of education. Um, or my other alternative was that I could um, you know, move out to New Jersey where I had no friends or family and I could uh, go work for Merck. And, Honestly, at the time, it seemed like a no-brainer. You know, I should go work for Teach for America if I, you know, wanted to be a Christian good person and not sell my soul. And uh, at the time, though, honestly, I think the reason I chose Merck was more because I was afraid my dad would kill me if I just spent all this money on, like, a private school education and then didn't use any of it. <laughs> so I guess secretly my plan was, like, okay, I'll go work for Merck for a little bit and then I'll, you know, go do something good with my life. And um, you know, I guess what I'm here to talk about is how I've been able to work for Merck and yet still do something good with my life. And um, so my story is really about Project Sacred Dream. And uh, what this is about is, um, just like Peter was describing, um, the number one way to address healthcare disparities in Native American populations is not really any of the traditional ways that a company like Merck might service a population 
It's not about um, you know, giving away free medication. It's not about providing um, adherence programs. Um, it's not about providing um, disease education even. Uh, none of those things really even scratch the surface when it comes to what's truly needed in, in, uh, in this area. Um, the number one thing that is going to help address healthcare disparities is to alleviate poverty. So the number one thing that Merck could do to help Indian country is to give them jobs. And so what I set out to do was to form a company with Merck that would be on a reservation and employ uh, Native Americans. Um, so the company that we uh, have started is a call center. Um, a call center, you know, this is an industry that is uh, notoriously being shipped overseas. Um, and so to be able to bring this job back to the U.S. and create jobs is, um, I guess, kind of innovative right now. <laughs> and um, so what we're doing is we're actually starting the business uh, on the reservation that we found that we feel needs the most help. So we're starting our business in South Dakota with the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe in Eagle View, South Dakota. Uh, this specific tribe has almost a 90% unemployment rate. And the per capita income of a household there is only $5,000 a year. So the poverty there is just um, so extreme. Uh, when you go visit this location, you would you know, think you're in a third world country. And um, the call center that we are starting, uh, we're able to kind of get into this business because Merck actually has a wholly owned subsidiary that's a call center company called Telerex. Um, and so what we're doing is we're going into a joint venture with the tribe. The tribe is, is actually going to be the majority owner of this business. Um, that actually is going to help Merck because that makes us a diverse supplier. And that makes us uh, very attractive when it comes to getting government call center business, which as you can imagine with the rollout of Obamacare, there's a ton of government call center business to be had right now. And there is no such thing as a minority owned call center uh, here in the U.S. right now. So that's kind of like the what's in it for Merck. Um, those, are, that's, th those are contracts we wouldn't be able to get otherwise. Uh, what's in it for the tribe is that they actually own this business. They, they will be the majority owner of it. Um, they you know, have skin in the game. They have uh, the you know, influence and responsibility and desire to employ their tribal members. Uh, we, in our five-year business plan, are expecting to be able to employ up to 500 people um, in South Dakota. Uh, and this is something that's going to change the face of, um, you know, generations for people in this, in this tribal community. Uh, right now, their biggest health care issues are um, tuberculosis. Um, they have extreme overcrowding in their households because they don't have enough housing. They don't have enough access to clean water. Uh, these are all things that are going to change once people in this community have jobs. Um, so my experience was that uh, I would never be able to start a company like this without, you know, the, I guess the, the name and the power and the connections and, 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 and the, the network that Merck provides me. Um, so being able to leverage the power of this company to do um, something like Project Sacred Dream, um, you know, this is how I'm able to fulfill the dream of what I wanted to do when I was, you know, graduating college and thought that I was just trying to make my dad not mad at me. Um, you know, it's, it's possible to work for a big company and bring your whole self to work um, and still achieve the, the dreams that you have. You don't have to sell your soul <laughs> to, to work for a big company. So I guess my story and my encouragement is just that there's a lot of good that can be done to alleviate poverty um, in big business. Uh, hey there, everybody. Um, so excited to be here today. Uh, thanks to Josh and Meredith for the invite, and thank you for all you showing up. I know this is D.C., which means you've all written 15-point policy papers by now on the implications for business and poverty, and um, I'm just joke. Um, and I'm just excited to be here with you. Uh, so it was the fall of 2008. I was working in private equity real estate and was very passionate uh, about the built environment and its ability to build better communities. And then 
uh, as you're all aware, the financial market uh, crashed and put a damper on that dream for a while. Um, a few months before the market crashed, uh, a mentor of mine had stopped by the house. Um, and Michael had just come from a telephone call with his friend Peter Greer, who had this bright idea that uh, we should apply business thinking to the healthcare challenges of the poor. And Michael asked if I thought that was interesting. I said, sure, what is it? You know. So Michael and I spent the next couple of uh, weeks working really hard on a business plan, um, flew up to uh, Pennsylvania, met with Peter and his team, and we were so excited about this idea that we had, and we are like, great, where should we put this thing? You know, and they said, oh, you should put it in Burundi. Uh, well, Michael and I didn't pick up on the sarcasm, and so we actually put this thing in Burundi. <laughs> um, and uh, I really had, I mean, it was a fantastic time. We were very fortunate. Uh, I was there the next two and a half years helping to launch LifeNet, and we were able to help local churches who operated clinics and hospitals to um, improve uh, the care they gave patients. But one of the things that was interesting about my experience there was that, and if you've traveled at all to East Africa, you'll know this, you can show up in this village and it looks like a Skittles factory has blown up, right? You have these bright reds and yellows and greens and they just paint entire walls and this stuff, right? And in the middle of it, you see a cell phone company's logo. And, uh, and so it's interesting because I started thinking about this and those cell phone companies being there, a clinic that we're working in, a nurse can call another nurse at another clinic and ask a question if she's unsure about a procedure. She can call into Bujumbura, the capital, and understand um, you know, if medicines are available. You know, more broadly, farmers have better access to market data and can increase their productivity and the earnings that they uh, are making and send their kids to school. And so what was interesting to me about that was here I am, and our explicit job was to save lives, and we were doing incredible work doing it. But then there's this untold story of this telecom that wasn't a B corporation, it wasn't a social enterprise, uh, and they themselves probably weren't aware of the social impact that they were having and implications for countries like Burundi. So I left uh, in 2012, came back, uh, and went to uh, graduate school down the road here at the University of Virginia. Um, and during that time, I had the privilege to sit under Ed Freeman, who's the academic behind stakeholder theory that you heard about uh, in the book. And uh, I mean, the, the short of that is that businesses can be run in such a way that really account for all the stakeholders in a business and not just the financial stakeholders, and that we really can build businesses that are better for everyone. One of the assignments in class was for us to think deeply about a problem uh, in the world and then think of a handful of solutions of how you might be able to solve that. And I mean, the, my, my colleagues there that are much more talented than me came up with these fabulous problems that were meaningful and deep and really compelling. But then what struck me was that the nature of their solutions were all nonprofits and social enterprises. And so it was really a point of frustration because I thought, you know, if the only way for us to contribute and solve a meaningful problem is to start a nonprofit, why are we here? You know, we could, we could do this a lot cheaper uh, if we weren't. Um, and so that is to say that the conversation we're having and that Peter and Chris are trying to start and invigorate is broader than even the church. That, that all sorts of people, even in business, really struggle to understand the implications of our work. Uh, as Josh mentioned, I'm now at M&T, uh, which is a community bank based in Buffalo, New York. Um, just a side note, never ask me for directions. I'm in between Bujumbura and Buffalo. Um, <laughs> just don't give me the GPS. Um, but I'm so excited to be that in that city. Uh, I really am. Um, at the turn of the 20th century, Buffalo was a top five city in the US. For 100 years, it was the world's biggest and busiest grain port. Um, changes in the global economic environment kind of wiped it out, as it did for many American Rust Belt cities. Um, but there's so much vitality and there's so much positive energy in that city right now that's literally one of the poorest now in America. And as a commercial banker, I get to be part of that every single day. For the real estate developers that are taking uh, you know, abandoned buildings and converting them into lofts or building incubator space for startups, or building new hospitals and building spaces for shops and all of these things that contribute to a thriving community. We get to fund those projects. It's incredible the work that we get to do. Just last week we were visiting um, a client that's a nonprofit college in the city. Uh, in this particular college, they specialize in uh, first generation college attendees 
and work to get them into college and then work to help them graduate. Uh, and so it's just a s tremendous mission for this school that really changes the trajectories of all the students there uh, and the vitality that they can provide for their families that are really living at the margins, some of them. And as bankers, we get to provide the financing that helps them operate on a day-to-day -day basis. And without us, they couldn't do that important mission that contributes so much to our city. The last example I'll share is uh, of a high school educated entrepreneur who figured out how to take the methane gas that landfills produce uh, and convert it into energy that he could sell back to the grid. So he literally figured out how to make something of the waste of our waste, right? And through his relationship with a bank, we were able to help fuel the growth of his company into a substantial business. Um, and I could go on and on with examples of how finance is fueling flourishing, right? Um, but I won't because we're about out of time. Um, but you know, I, I I really hope that our stories here today have uh, you know help expand your imagination um, because we need it. You know, as as uh, you know, P Peter and Lisa have shared, like we need help. We need people who are thoughtful and want to join us. Um, and helping a world that desperately needs more flourishing. Thanks. So with that, uh, I hope you have some questions prepared. We're, we're going to turn to you in one moment. I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative and ask one question that has been a conversation with some of our student groups recently, and that's this. There is sometimes a reticence to apply this big insight from the international context about how work provides meaning and entrepreneurship and the talents exist within to, to lead to fuller life to our domestic poverty situation. And I wonder if you might briefly comment on that. Um, you know, does that apply? Is there sort of a permanent underclass that gets created when you add up various anti-poverty entitlement benefits here in the United States? And would you speak to that? Or, or why is that reticence often there, might, might you say? I need to turn my mic on. <laughs> and what I also uh, have come to believe uh, is that I want to celebrate where I see this happening in the US. And the same things that I've learned internationally, they're happening here. Uh, I've got a uh, friend, David Spickard, who uh, is running the organization Jobs for Life. And what they do is job preparedness training and realize that there are employment opportunities if they can help people get more of the skills that are necessary. So he's doing a great job there. There's another group called Grace Period that's trying to be an alternative to payday lending. People that prey on people in their desperation and provide an alternative. There's a, a, a guy, uh, Oi Waddell, who started Hustle Phoenix, applying the same principles in the inner city. And the list goes on. So I don't buy the argument that the opportunities that and, and what we've seen internationally that there's not an application here. I uh, think perhaps part of it is that we're not uh, celebrating, uh, highlighting uh, the great stories that do exist. And, and that's kind of my personal passion. And if you know of other organizations that are doing a great job, I'd love to hear it. Because uh, I think there's a whole lot going right. Um, and uh, yeah, just fundamentally don't believe that the opportunity to do job training, uh, for us, uh, biblical, uh, uh, literacy as well as financial literacy as well as groups of people coming together in relationship as well as capital savings and access to small loans I believe those same ingredients are and can continue to have a pretty significant impact uh, here as well Terrific. well with that we turn to you for questions I think our first one maybe just behind you Meredith. hi uh, Lloyd Solis University of Maryland um, my question is uh, basically for Peter, but uh, the two other panelists can answer this too. Um, two simple questions. Number one is about our students or graduates. We have a lot of college graduates now who are jobless, who cannot find a job for a long time. They've been applying 
sending hundreds of applications, but only two or three would give a reply. So what advice can you give to our college graduates? Would you suggest that they would go into entrepreneurship or they would go into regular in-the-box employment? And number two, uh, about our foreign students, our immigrants, we are training them. Uh, or, um, they get their degrees from American colleges, universities with masters and doctorate degrees. Very bright, very promising, very talented. But after that, their, their talents are not put into good use. So what suggestions can you give to these young people? Thank you. Yeah, no, thanks for the question. And I'd love to hear uh, thoughts. I mean, Jonathan, you just got out of uh, grad school uh, yeah. as well not long ago. But I think for me, just two, two quick thoughts. First thing on the jobs on individuals coming out, I sometimes feel like we have uh, perhaps um, emphasized education um, uh, in terms of uh, only thinking in a formal educational setting. And I would love to see the conversation about education be broader than just one area. And the idea that somehow you'll be fully prepared for whatever jobs you want through a formal education uh, setting, I think, misses out on the educational opportunities that are all around you for all of life. The idea of if you desire to go into a nonprofit, to go on in your undergrad, and then to immediately go to graduate school thinking this is what you want to do, coming out of it with a mountain of debt, I don't think makes a whole lot of sense. Uh, so I, I, first thing is make sure you know what you're studying, that this truly is your calling, this is your passion, and you're good at it. Um, and so as much as possible, take time, whether that's taking a semester off, whether that's delaying starting initially for some, whether that's taking time between undergrad and grad school, give yourself the real life opportunities to make sure that it is the right investment for you. Personally, I was off between uh, undergrad and graduate school five years. When I went back to graduate school, I had enough hooks of real life experience that my educational experience, I knew where to put that information. I knew which hook to hang it on. And I think there's a tremendous benefit. Second thing is I think that sometimes we m underestimate uh, the opportunity to have a learning opportunity in every single job. When I graduated from undergrad, I wanted to do international microfinance. Every single door shut. I thought I was compromising by moving back and moving in with my family. Well, that part was a compromise, <laughs> move in with your family part. Um, but it was an incredible opportunity where I got to work in the business office of Lexington Christian Academy, and I got to learn all the practical skills about what it takes to do the back office running of a nonprofit. And I think in a similar way, don't let the ideal get in the way with the good opportunities that you have right now and do everything possible to learn everything you can wherever you are. There are no wasted educational opportunities if you have the mind and if you have the eyes to take advantage of them. Yeah, uh, yeah so I'll just add a, a little bit to what Peter said there. Um, yeah, very um, winding path for me in my, in my own career. And so I took internships when I had the opportunity to try to leverage those in to um, roles and looking at that skill set and toolkit that uh, is really transferable between those. Um, in no way did I plan for my own entrepreneurial career. It kind of like dumped into my lap and we went with it. Um, and so I think that's also something that we can be thinking about of, uh, you know, the research points to the way entrepreneurs start businesses is not necessarily with the world, you know, world's best idea. It's who do you know? What do I know? What do I know how to do? Um, and how can I put these things together in a way th that delivers something to the market that it's going to value? Um, you know, and I, I would also just comment on, on the international point of it. Um, you know, immigrants into this country have a much higher rate uh, of starting businesses and being entrepreneurial. One of the reasons why is that, you know, you come from India with a PhD and nobody knows it here, right? And so it's really tough for them to find employment, you know, uh, um, with a big corporation. And so they're forced into starting new businesses. And so sometimes that necessity can actually be an entrepreneurial spark to help you get going. Thank you. This question is for Elise. Um, you, you had said that it, it was hoped 
that there would be 500 positions filled in the call center. Is there in the design or in the charter a requirement that those positions be held by members of the tribe that owns the call center? Yeah, that's a great question. So as part of the, the contracts that we have with the tribe, um, you know, one of the, I guess, biggest pieces of the financial puzzle that kind of makes it work for both sides is that the, uh, the government provides a $4,500 um, tax credit per Native American employee that your company employs for like the life of that employee. So there's a huge <laughs> incentive to hire uh, Native American people as part of the business, so much so that we didn't even have to include a certain number of seats in the contract. Um, it just financially for both parties, you know, that's what makes the, the, the most sense and the best sense for both of us. Um, I've got a follow-up question to that. First of all, um, I want to thank everyone on this panel for being here. I think this is a wonderful topic. Um, I'll introduce myself. My name is Fatima Argan. I'm a strategy consultant, and um, my background is actually in minority entrepreneurship, and I really salute you for doing the work that you're doing at Merck. Um, secondly, I want to say that, you know, it's what you're – uh, talking about is great, but it's really nothing new. It's been going on for quite some time, actually, and um, and, and it, I think it's it's very important that we include business as part of the you know poverty alleviation and solutions uh, ecosystem because they really play an important part in coming up with the solutions, with providing resources. But additionally, I think it's also important that we include government in this partnership because. They can be an important stakeholder too, and if you leave them out of the equation, then you know the the solution. You can you can do well, but I think you know working in partnership with all parties um, provides the best solution for everybody. Um, I was going to ask you just in terms of the um, the. I think it's great that Merck brought the um, the call center back to the U.S. But are they paying um, the people at the call center? Uh, I mean, how are they able to finance that? Because I know that they pay people overseas. One of the reasons for outsourcing overseas is to save money. How are they able to do that? Yeah, that's a really great question. And um, you know, that was one of the, I guess, critical success factors of this entire business model was that the people that are employed by this business, they must make you know, more than just a living wage. And so right now, um, the people in this call center are actually making $13 an hour. And the reason we're able to do that is because we're operating on reservation land. Um, uh, the, the, the kinds of um, you know, tax incentives and you know, gifting laws when you're working with tribes are just so, uh, so different and so um, you know, advantageous to businesses that if you can, you know, have enough trust that a tribe wants to work with you, um, that area becomes just like a low tax rate jurisdiction in some other country overseas. So our, our margins and our financials, um, our call center looks uh, actually better than a call center in Mexico and is close to what call centers look like in India. Good afternoon, panel. My name's Todd Wiggins. I have a, before uh, I start my question, I wanted to ask you, Peter, have you been here before? I believe I've seen you here at the presentation. I have been here. Yeah, as I remember your enthusiasm, you, I was just as fascinated to see you today as I did the last time you were here. Um, I wanted to ask the panel, have you by chance seen a, a movie that was just released called A Good Lie, which I think has uh, some relevance to the work that you're all doing because it's about an American bringing over uh, rebels, actually Sudanese rebels during, I think it was a post 2001 or so, bringing them over here and teaching them how to get develop job skills and working them their way out of poverty. Poverty. So, yes, the law voice. Correct. Thank you. So, if any of you could make, it sounds like all of you have this very interesting, colorful story of your own that could possibly be made into 
a cinema production. And if you were to do that, for instance, in South Dakota, I mean, it sounds like it could be um, you know, some great producer could come along and take your story and make it into something that can inspire people on a much larger scale. Have you ever thought about your life as a movie? Entrepreneurial magic dust at work. Yeah. <laughs> no, I haven't. <laughs> but it does sound like an amazing idea. <laughs> it's interesting. I mean, how many documentaries are there about the financial crisis? And I believe that media exists on the fringe. It exists oftentimes on the fringe of the bad. These are the bad stories. We're going to tell these stories. How fantastic would it be if we were more adept at telling the fringe stories, which hopefully don't stay fringe for too long, of the really good stuff that's happening around the world? If you know anyone, uh, producers, have them contact at least, because that's a story <laughs> that needs to be told. Tyler, we have one right here. Hi, I'm Kwanzaa, and I want to thank you guys so much for all of the aha moments that I have today. Um, I, I work for the Internal Revenue Service, so I'm bringing government into it just a second. Uh, and not all of us are bad, just to let you guys know. But uh, we have a Christian organization at the IRS. It's an employee organization called Christian Fundamentalist Internal Revenue Employees. And the fourth Saturday of every month, we go out to Franklin Park, and we do give away like clothing or um, toiletry items some you know some things that our friends in the park actually need but i've been learning here and from the book uh for the least of these uh, that was the last presentation that i was here for that it's most important that we help our friends in the park find jobs like you were you all were saying today to find jobs and to pull out that gem that's in each and every single one of us human beings you know and to help to discover our purposes and so Elise you really helped me so much because I've been at the IRS for 15 years I've been in federal government almost 18 years and I'm one of two Affordable Care Act plan managers my office manages the entire IT budget for the IRS and I'm one of two uh, manager, financial plan managers for the Affordable Care Act. In so many days, I say, Lord, why am I here? Why do you have me here? And so uh, your story helped me understand that I don't have to quit my job to join a nonprofit or, um, you know, just up and, and, and leave my good benefits to start a nonprofit when I could be do, making a greater impact where I am, especially with that name, Internal Revenue Service. All of us are impacted by the IRS. I hope we're all compliant in this room. But, um, and, just, and just moving forward with that, maybe having a conversation with a commissioner and, and seeing if we can employ some of our friends in the park whom we've established relationships with over the past four years, seeing if we can employ some of them at the IRS, you know? I mean, all of us started somewhere. We didn't just come in geniuses. We, we had to learn a skill and learn what we're doing and why can't we teach others who want to be employed and not continue to receive handouts, why can't we help them do the same thing, you know? So thank you guys so much. Yeah, you're, you're welcome. And I just wanted to make, make one quick point about that. So Project Sacred Dream was born out of an employee resource group at Merck. So um, just like the group that you're talking about, um, I founded a Native American group at Merck. And traditionally, what the group had done is every November during Native American Heritage Month, uh, we would bring in a dance troupe and we'd serve you know Native cuisine in the cafeteria. But I went to the senior leaders that sponsored the diversity initiatives in our company and said, you know, wouldn't it be better if we could actually use what we know about Native American culture and impact the bottom line of the business? And of course they said yes. And so it is something as simple as these employee organizations that almost all big companies have that you can leverage to do something big. We do have a question from one of our LCC, International University students uh, called Constantine, who says, so okay, we get it, uh, but we have, fall, we have fall break coming up, and we're thinking about some concrete way to help the poor. Um, I want to help now, but I'm not in a position to give someone a job short term. So is there some better way? What are some, some short term things we can do to stay on your long term arc? So 
I love the question. Um, I love that this is someone who has a fall break coming up and says, what can I do? Enough talking, like what can I do? So I love that, the, the heart behind the question. Uh, I, I think sometimes we uh, perhaps overestimate what we can do in a short time and underestimate what can happen in a long time. And so my first thought uh, for that individual is find the local organizations that are doing amazing work and go and ask the question, how can I help you? Um, so if there's a local group that uh, is doing job preparedness training, figure out what they need. What does the staff need? Are, is there training that they can provide? Is there something? But sometimes to instead of always being at the forefront, figure out who's doing the great work and ask the question, how can I help you in the long-term work that you're doing? So that, I guess, would be the first piece. Find the great organizations and then ask what you can do to actively help them. Thank you so much. Two questions. The president of the World Bank has just announced a great commitment for uh, financial inclusion. And much of it, it's about uh, financial literacy. How would you relate to this? What advice would you would give to the president of the World Bank? My second question, all three of you, uh, he needs advice, I can assure you, <laughs> so, uh, with what you did. but. Uh, second question, you seem to have a strong, deep background as Christians, all three of you, correct? Uh, how, could you imagine to do uh, this part of this work if you had not been yourself Christians and learn from grandfather and grand, grand or so on? Uh, because this is America, and America is different from Europe. I mean, you are just... Uh, it's, I don't know how many centuries away in Europe when you just mentioning Christian principles in Europe you are excluded from the most advanced countries whether north or south and therefore uh, Russia Putin can say that he is there to protect Western Christian <laughs> against persecution in the West so uh, this cultural quote unquote aspects thank you um, so I'll answer the second part first. Um, I mean, I, I would say both in my experience in the nonprofit world at LifeNet and in the for-profit world. Yeah, I think we're on. I just need to get closer. Um, that this is one of the great things about business is that I feel like it brings us equal playing ground where we can come from all sorts of backgrounds and contribute towards a common cause, that we can be co-belligerents, right, towards this stuff. And so I think language, uh, like stakeholder theory, I mean, so from coming from a faith background, you're like, wow, that looks a lot like Shalom. And, and we have this rich Judeo-Christian uh, heritage uh, and rich language and theology behind that. But I can also equally make a business case as to why that makes sense. And it's just better to run a business um, in, in that fashion. And so I think that there's tremendous opp opportunity in thinking like this uh, to collaborate. care to comment on the role of Christian faith in this? Yeah, case. And, and as well as the World Bank uh, question as well. So um, I've not been asked by anyone at the World Bank for my opinions, but <laughs> thank you for giving me the opportunity. Uh, so World Bank, if anyone is here, a uh, couple things that I've just learned on a, on a personal uh, standpoint. Uh, one is that uh, there is incredible, incredible untapped power in savings and uh, and what, initially, I got into microfinance after hearing about the Grameen Bank and Mohammed Yunus and making small loans to individuals around the world, and they use these loans, and, and incredible things happen. After being in it, uh, those stories don't always happen, and I believe there's been a movement to just say, let's give everyone access to a small loan, and then we turn around and realize some people are just over-indebted and worse off than they were before. That doesn't help anyone. So I believe everyone should be a saver. And when I think about financial literacy, whether it's in this country, whether it's with my children, or whether I think about it uh, at the international level, I believe there's an incredible way that if we emphasize simple savings and a simple savings account, and if you earn $1, you should save some of it. And if you earn $1,000, you should save some of it. 
I believe that savings also reorients people from thinking about today to thinking about the future and has an incredible long-term impact. And there's some great innovations of how savings is having a dramatic impact on societies. So I'd love to have a conversation with the World Bank about savings and how technology actually is equipping and enabling and decreasing the barriers that previously existed in formal financial uh, uh, industries. Second thing on the on the Christian uh, standpoint, I believe that the pushback against uh, believers, uh, against followers of Jesus, is primarily because followers of Jesus have done a fairly poor job actually following the example of Jesus and have had agendas other than how do we love God and how do we love others. And so if that day I comes and as it continues to come, if there's pushback, I hope people would see a track record of someone who totally makes a bunch of mistakes, but at the very core is living a life of generosity, of living a life of service, of living a life that the words that we say match the life that we say about there's more than just what we have in our hands. And so I hope there's credibility that actually starts to be rebuilt as people take the call that Christ makes on us seriously. The second piece is perhaps similar to, to Jonathan, is I, I think that eventually everyone's going to ask deeper questions of life. I believe that whether it's in a midlife crisis or whether it's uh, on 80s when you're in a hospital, eventually everyone has these moments where they realize that everything that we see, like, it's, it's not what we thought it would be. Eventually, even the uh, comedian Jim Carrey said this on, on Twitter, said, uh, I wish everyone could achieve everything that they ever would be rich, be famous, have everything that they'd ever dreamed of so that they can see it's not the answer. I believe that eventually in everyone's life there becomes a point where you either catch your dream or you lose hope that you're never going to catch your dream and that opens up conversations about something that's much deeper that in our heart we know we know there's something more and and so I just think we need to continue to be in places be in relationships where those conversations happen whether that's <laughs> Europe or whether that's in the US um, and continue to have lives that really do reflect uh, the words that we say. Just a brief comment on that question about the World Bank. It's a little bit of a stretch, but it's in the book, and I wanted to just call attention to this. There is uh, a wonderful footnoted study in the book that was commissioned by the World Bank that talks about the question, how do you define poverty? Where do you set the line? And, you know, in the United States, it's $26,000 for a family of four. And in other parts of the world, it's, it's different. But this study had a number of open-ended questions, and it went around and asked people abroad, how do you define poverty? And it expected from some material answer. And you know what it was? It was shame. It was a sense of helplessness. It was a sense of incapacity to earn for my own children, as Peter described earlier. I think that's very interesting that you know the World Bank would also shine the spotlight on this larger core relational insight. One more question. Could I just um, answer the question? Just I just wanted to add um, in relation to the religious part of the thing. Um, I think it's great that you all have, a, you know, dedication to a certain religious tradition, but I think it's also important that um, in order for a lot of these programs to be um, more successful, it would be helpful to be more religiously inclusive. I think there are a lot of other religious traditions that are working in this area. Um, you know, we can include Christian, we can include, you know, Jewish, Jewish tradition, you know, Muslims, um, Buddhists, atheists, there's a lot of atheists that are actually quite active in this area. So I think just sort of a, you know, a, a spirit of inclusiveness would be, um, would add a lot to. Point noted. Yep. It's a, it's a unique conversation we're getting to have here today among a particular uh, college constituency, and it's a, it's, a, it's a point well worth making. There's amazing work happening in a number of religious faith traditions around the country. Uh, is there one more question in the, in the back? No, very good. All right, we've got one more from uh, Jakobs Bickus and one of his students uh, in Lithuania who asks, um, for those, um, if, you, if you are a, a, a Christian in, engaging in this enterprise, do you provide, is it most important to provide your assistance primarily for those in the Christian community or for people more broadly? I, just, I can talk about the yeah. personal experience uh, that I, I believe that the historical uh, record of any sort of exclusivity on how you decide who you help with and who you don't uh, is 
oftentimes a failed experiment. Uh, so with the model of hope, we serve everyone regardless of where they are in their personal faith journey um, and uh, just believe that that's the right thing to do. So there is no uh, any sort of discrimination on how we choose the families that we serve. Um, I, I think that's a separate question, um, though, from the other question, uh, which relates is, is there a role for faith-based organizations? Uh, which, again, is a separate, probably, conversation for the topic that we have here. It's a very important conversation. I certainly do believe that there is an important element that our Christian identity allows us a greater impact, uh, a unique impact that we're allowed to have because of our identity, but that's a separate conversation from do we only target individuals of a certain faith uh, persuasion. I understand um, how the businesses can have a long-term impact, but do you think or is there a place for nonprofits in more of those short-term uh, effects? Um, I can take that. Uh, yeah, so I kind of looked at it um, by starting with the nature of the problem that we're trying to solve. And so, I mean, I think there's very much, you know, nobody's going to uh, disagree with relief work, right, um, when a natural disaster happens or there are just times of extreme need. And certainly, we want to extend compassion there. And in, in certain time frames, that is the right thing to do. Um, but over the, you know, so over the long term, though, I think we need to think about the nature of the problem and, um, and what the appropriate player is along the line. So it might start off as relief, but we'd hope that people get on their feet, and then there's vitality, and maybe a nonprofit comes in. But eventually, we want to see you know, that, that independence um, and the ability for you know, business to create that long-term term good. But everybody has a you know, part to play. Uh, thank you. I'm Leon Weintraub, University of Wisconsin. I just wanted to m make sure that in discussing the role of private enterprise, which is extremely important, as well as the role of faith-based and other nonprofit organizations that we don't really leave out the role of government. Perhaps you thought it was there all the time, but we really have to include it. I mean, look what happened after the fall of the Iron Curtain in the Soviet e Union. We had fantastic introduction of c c c c capitalism and the private sector in Russia, and we see where that led. And there's a lot of other countries around the world that have private enterprise attempting to generate the jobs, but without rule of law, without a system of courts that are recognized as impartial, without a police force that's respected, respectful as nonpartisan, that someone has to set the rules of the game. The private sector can't operate without that. So, so I just wanted to say, emphasizing the importance of the private sector in generating the jobs, the role of the, non, of the nonprofits in, in dealing with with relief and other aspects, someone has to set the rules of the games that everyone's aware of that. So let's let's not forget that. The places that I uh, spend my time when I'm not uh, based in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, uh, Haiti, Burundi, Democratic Republic of Congo, Republic of Congo, Zimbabwe, uh, India, China, Philip, all sorts of places around the world. Uh, my last trip to Haiti, I was uh, at a roadblock and we were going around it and there was a group of bandits that uh, were not happy that we were going around the roadblock, pulled out uh, pistols, cocked it, ran at us, uh, pointing it at our heads um, and uh, that started a negotiation for the right price to go through that roadblock. Um, that is a strong disincentive for people to invest in that part of the world uh, when there's not rule of law. I was not feeling all warm and fuzzy about the desire of investing more in that community, uh, let alone from a nonprofit standpoint, let alone uh, from a for-profit enterprise. If there is not rule of law, uh, it is so hard for progress to come. Likewise, the labor laws in certain places, we had an employee that was uh, stealing money and it uh, was proven, there was no doubt of that. As a foreign organization, it was impossible for us to let that individual go. 
<laughs> what? <laughs> like, so there's no question whether it's a labor law, whether it's security, whether it's private property rights, all of those are the necessary ingredients. And there are time and time again around the world where we see the contrast. I think one of the most stark contrasts is North Korea and South Korea. 1976, North Korea had a better educated, uh, more productive workforce than even China. And today, uh, North Korea has Dennis Rodman. Um, you know, <laughs> not like progress. Um, South Korea has Samsung, Hyundai, and LG. Incredible progress. And why is that? Well, a key part of that was the regulatory environment opening up to free enterprise and a government that understood the benefit of providing an environment where people could productively invest and have relative assurance that their investment is going to be protected. So point well taken. Again, the role of government is huge. Um, and uh, all these other things, if there's not some basic building blocks in place, makes it really, really hard. Yeah, thank you. Just add quickly to that that our, our Christian college professors with whom we're in touch on a daily basis, you know, couldn't agree more. And that's part of why Peter's and Chris's uh, citation of the Brookings study that looks at, you know, what were the core um, elements necessary for prosperity to rise abroad, like we've seen happen in the, in the last 40 years, a trend that we hope obviously continues, um, perhaps doing away with, with poverty as we know it in our, in our lifetime in the next 35 years, as Bill Gates talks about in the, in the book. You know, what were the core conditions necessary? What well, was those five things? It was entrepreneurship, property rights, free trade, rule of law, globalization. Those things don't happen without the basic rules of the game being, being set. And our Christian college professors you know, greatly appreciate that core insight as they're doing their work. Yes, ma'am, I see your hand. I have a, um, my name is Marion, I'm a student at Emmanuel College and I'm currently interning here in Washington. And um, <clears throat> I have a question that's a bit more practical and it's a bit loaded, so I hope, I don't know if you'll be able to answer it now. Perfect, last question, that's it, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, well, what advice would you give to students who want to go into business uh, as an entrepreneur, but also want to do what hope and the other organizations are doing by helping, because I was born in Kenya, and so I would like to help um, fellow Kenyans start businesses, but I don't necessarily want to start a profit business in Kenya. So how do you, what, what advice would you give to someone wanting to go into that line of, of work? Sure, I'll, I'll start. Um, I think you know what you're describing is kind of similar to what I've done with with Project Sacred Dream, and um, I guess the first thing I would say is, um, in my situation, I have been able to do both as far as the nonprofit and big business because um, I'm also the the chairwoman of the PA regional board for Hope International. So I love Hope and I love what they do. And by becoming um, the chairwoman of their board, I've been able to um, you know, really contribute to uh, an organization that I feel passionately about, but still you know, have my employment at Merck. So I think if there's um, you know, the, 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 the possibility of finding a nonprofit that does what you wanna do, um, you know, getting on their board or be becoming involved with them is a way you could do both. Um, and then I guess as far as actually like working for a big company and still trying to make your dream uh, come true, you know, there's, there's three really important lessons that I've learned through Sacred Dream at Merck. Um, you know, the first is to do your homework. Um, I was at Merck for six years before I had my first conversation about Sacred Dream, even though I knew for years before that, that that's what I wanted to do. Um, it took that long for me to do the market research to figure out what business, where, um, is it viable, what tribe, how would it work? Um, so I, I, I did my homework before I ever approached someone about what I wanted to do. Um, and then I also knew my company well enough to figure out how I needed to position what I wanted to do to also meet their interests. Um, you know, the second thing I learned was that you have to find allies. So I went and found the highest people at the top that I could 
that would also feel uh, the passion and the excitement around what I wanted to do, but these were also very experienced seasoned professionals that could give me the advice that I needed, seeing as how I never started a business before. I had no idea what I was doing. And these people were also you know, seasoned professionals with the company and could you know, let me know, you know these are the minefields that you need to look out for as you're trying to push this up you know, through the company. Um, so those allies were critical. And then the third thing was just to never give up. <laughs> I, I can't tell you um, how many times uh, the door was slammed on this project. Before, just this last April, I sat in front of our CEO in every single one of his direct reports and introduced Project Sacred Dream and got the stamp of approval. And that took a long time and there's um, you know, so many times when I could have just given up and I could have said, this is, there's no way this is gonna happen. So that's probably the most important piece of advice, never give up. <laughs> I'll just add to that briefly. Um, I would just challenge the assumption that you can't do both. Uh, so I started in the private sector. Um, you know, Michael would have never talked to me if I didn't have valuable skills that could have contributed to that idea. So knowing how to put together investor deck, knowing how to build financial models so we could project what it would look like, those are huge skills that really, really helped us early on, super practical. But at the same time, my work at LifeNet has totally shaped, you know, definitely my experience in grad school. And even now as I approach banking, like having that international experience, having a global perspective, developing empathy, you know, even the hard skills that you, you take away from that were extremely important. And so I think I would just challenge that it doesn't have to be one or the other or you know, necessarily at the same time that your career can you know, take all, all sorts of twists and turns. Yeah, we're, I love this conversation and I love the questions and I don't want it to end, but it has to. But the uh, only thing that I would say, and I, I hope this conversation has been a part of, is just don't buy that there's some line between some work that has value and other work that has less value. Figure out what your passions are, figure out what your gifts are, and then pursue it with all your heart, seeking to maximize, not the financial return alone, seek to maximize the good that you can do. With that, we join in thanking our panelists. So you got a little more than you bargained for, advice for the World Bank and advice for a rising business student. Thank you so much for coming and good afternoon.